And we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And g'day, so good to see you. And the first thing we need to understand about today's Bible reading from John chapter 14, verses 15 to 31, is that it is still part of the conversation during the Passover, Last Supper meal. And during last week's message, we saw Jesus giving his disciples some good, solid, sound teaching to help them understand what is important to know about their faith. And now Jesus continues prepping his disciples with what they need to know and understand about their faith in him so they can face life without his physical presence. For back in chapter 6 verse 68, heaps of people had found Jesus' teachings too tough to swallow and had walked out. And Jesus had turned to his disciples asking whether they would leave too. And Peter, on behalf of the disciples, makes this significant confession of faith. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus knew that this wonderful confession of faith from Peter and the disciples would not be enough to stand the tough test that is about to happen any moment now, where their fledging faith in him will be tested to its uppermost limits. And like he had just told Peter, will lead to denials, even though Peter is denying it at the moment. And the second thing we need to understand is that this reading is part of Jesus' lengthy discourse that doesn't finish until the end of chapter 17, which Jesus wraps up with, Righteous Father, although the world does I do. And these disciples know you have sent me. I made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. And chapter 17's conclusion refers back to the main themes in today's reading. And so we shouldn't look at today's verses as a stand-alone narrative. And yet, to complicate matters, the third thing we need to realize is that chapter 14 verses 15 to 31 are also an inclusio sandwich where the beginning and end verses of the discourse mirror each other's theme and the middle verse is reinforcing the importance of the theme making it also a self-contained piece of information to help them grow in their faith. And in verse 15, Jesus starts his discourse and then flashes the intro theme out in verse 21 with, If you love me, you will obey my commands. And by obeying my commands, my Father and I will love you and I will show myself to you. Clearly, Jesus considers loving him and obeying him are the two sides of the same coin. And the disciples hearing this would remember how Jesus, just before telling Peter that he would deny him, had given them this new command. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Yes, they were slowly starting to get the picture that we can't say we love Jesus and then not obey him. And then Jesus finishes the discourse in verse 31 with, I do exactly what my Father has commanded me, so the world will know that I love the Father. The disciples would have picked up how this dialogue was an inclusio sandwich and so would have thought of the time when Jesus had told them in chapter 6 verse 35 that I am the bread of life and connected the dots to see that what Jesus is telling them is the bread and butter that holds our life sandwiched together with Jesus and God 
To have God and Jesus in our lives requires our love and obedience to Jesus. And that means we must, no ifs, buts or maybes, love one another. And now before we modern people start thinking, hey, wait a minute, are you sure this is an inclusio sandwich? Jesus started talking about his disciples obeying him and is now finishing with himself obeying God. How is that the same thing? Ah, you focused on the obey Jesus part, which is good and important. But the main point Jesus is making is that if you truly love Jesus, you will obey what he commands and love not only Jesus, but other Christians. And for a lot of us, that is our sticking point. We like to think we know what is best for us and Jesus commanding us to love others. Well, it doesn't look good for us from our perspective. After all, Jesus doesn't know that person who just gets on my goat. Hmm, is that really true that Jesus doesn't know that person? And so when we really stop and look at verse 31, what we find is Jesus finishing his discourse by saying, I'm not asking you to do what I say while I go and do what I want to do. Oh no, Jesus is saying, I have set the bar high by my example of the way I am about to show my love for the Father in the way I am about to take by obeying God's tough command to end the sin problem once and for all through my death on the cross. And just in case the disciples missed the point, the middle verses reiterate the theme almost verbatim and take it even further as Jesus adds an extra incentive as to why they should love him and obey his commands with those who do not love me will not obey my word, whereas people who love me, they will obey my word. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Yes, it's obvious that Jesus thinks how vitally important it is that just like he has shown his love for God by obeying God, we too should show our love for Jesus by obeying Jesus. And the reward of having God and Jesus make their home with us was also in last week's reading. Therefore, we can be confident that God and Jesus are looking forward to that day when all those who have shown their love for God and Jesus by their obedience to Jesus' commands will finally be home with them. But before we look at what we need to obey, we need to circle back and see how Jesus wants his disciples to stop and really grasp what he is telling them before their world falls apart by letting them know that. And I have combined the verses so that you can hear the full impact the disciples would have felt when hearing them. These words you hear me tell you are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. You have heard me tell you all this while I am still with you. How shortly the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. For while I am going away, I am coming back to you. And because I live, you also will live. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. And naturally, the disciples not knowing what the future held, and because they had misunderstood the concept of how Jesus, as Messiah, was going to reclaim God's kingdom, they didn't get it. Why Jesus was talking prophetically to them, telling them stuff they didn't understand, so that when it happened, they would believe. And so, being confused by Jesus' words, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, says, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Now, just a quick aside. Don't you feel sorry for Judas and all the other Judases of the day who have suddenly had their name associated with betrayal and they 
had to be identified as not the Judas, although perhaps Jesus had two Judas in the group to negate the prevailing view that a name doesn't make a person. But something else does. And now, back to the narrative. Yes, the disciples didn't get it, that Jesus was talking about dying and coming back to life permanently. And why should they? They knew that even Lazarus would die again. And so we're expecting Jesus, as he talked about going away, to be going into the mountains like he had previously for a quiet time of prayer and reflection with God and then come back and claim his kingdom. And they were ready and willing to fight alongside of him. The only problem with that thinking was, why is Jesus constantly talking about love? After all, waging a war to win a kingdom and loving people are two totally different things. And it appears by what Jesus has said that Jesus is really into this loving him and showing it. For that is what makes a person by obeying him. And man, that was hard. They struggled to understand Jesus like he had just acted like a lowly slave and washed their feet. How could they love people the way Jesus had just loved them? And just think about how hard it must have been to consider loving like Jesus does. After literally seeing him die, one of the worst possible ways to die in a world that knew how to make people really suffer, on the cross for people who hated him so they could have their sins forgiven and how it was only afterwards that they could make sense of Jesus' cryptic statement that I will not speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. For three terribly long days that statement had not appeared to be true. And then along came Jesus, alive. Perhaps they could believe Jesus' other weird disclosures in verses 16 to 18 about how I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you for I will ask the Father to give you another counsellor who will be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you now your bible may have used a different word like advocate or helper as the greek word for the holy spirit covers a wide range of meanings and so like now john to not limit the holy spirit's attributes has added a feature of the spirit's work to help the reader understand which particular aspect of the Spirit is relevant to this narrative. And the Spirit of Truth is particularly apt for this description of the Holy Spirit. For as we learnt last week, Jesus frequently said, I tell you the truth. And so while the disciples didn't quite understand all of the Spirit's power just yet, they got it how the Spirit would be just like Jesus and tell the truth. And later, in verse 26, their thinking is confirmed when Jesus tells them that the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And just as the world didn't accept who Jesus is, they wouldn't accept the Holy Spirit, for he is even harder to comprehend. After all, he isn't flesh and blood like Jesus. And then what's even harder for the world to accept is that, like Jesus did, for as we find in chapter 8 verses 31 to 40, the disciples had heard Jesus say, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth which will set you free. And I tell you the truth, 
everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word, the truth that I heard from God. And so the disciples got it, how the Holy Spirit will be telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And how once again Jesus repeats a theme from earlier in chapter 14, verse 10, expanding it in verse 20 with, on that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And so us modern people should pause for a moment and give thanks to God for sending the Holy Spirit to help us know that such an incomprehensible concept is the truth. And that this truth, that Jesus is God, and through our faith, we are in Jesus. And because of our love and obedience, Jesus is in us, should help us see why Jesus told his disciples that, if you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Fair dinkum even knowing the final outcome and how much I benefit from Jesus going to the cross, it does seem bizarre for Jesus to be saying to his disciples, you should be glad I am going to the Father. And just think how hard it must have been for them when they realised that the way Jesus was taking to go back to the Father was not through something spectacular, say like Elijah and his chariot of fire going up to heaven in a whirlwind, but through the degrading, demoralizing agony of being counted a criminal and dying on the cross. And then Jesus, having braided together this triple truth strength cord where love for Jesus and obedience to his command combined with the spirit of truth, teaching and reminding them of these truths when and as they need it, Jesus is then able to tell his disciples. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now if you watched last week's sermon you will have gone, oh yes, the Greek word for troubled carries the meaning of acute emotional and mental distress and then connected the dots to realize that Jesus is prophetically warning the disciples that shortly they will be going through the worst emotional and mental distress that they have ever experienced. With a good dose of fear thrown into the turmoil to really make life look black and horrible. And if they can hold tightly onto his word and obey him, then Jesus will be able to give them a peace that is beyond the world's ability to give them. For he will give them the peace that he has, that while the Son of Man is not happy with what will happen shortly, the Son of God can see the way beyond the pain and have peace in the knowledge that obeying the Father is the right and only way to do Things. Now the disciples will not have grasped that fact for the three days Jesus was in the tomb. But then, upon seeing the resurrected Jesus, they enjoyed the peace of realizing that everything Jesus has said would happen, did. And so they can be 100% positive that Jesus was telling them the truth. And we modern people who haven't had to experience the disciples' three days of agony and uncertainty know that before it happened, Jesus told the disciples the truth. And Jesus was, was right when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Because Jesus, in complete obedience to the Father, took the way of the cross. And so now we not only have the amazing benefit of life through the forgiveness for our sins, we have the spirit of truth speaking into our hearts and minds, reminding us during those times when we are troubled by the distressing turn of events that we are experiencing that Jesus told the truth, the whole truth and nothing 
but the truth. And we that we can love other people. And therefore, because we believe Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, and because we also know that Jesus is the bread of life, and how this means that we should, in thankfulness for what Jesus has done for us, love Jesus and obey his commands to love others. For this is the bread and butter holding our faith sandwiched together. And then this knowledge will help us to be confident that Jesus has left us with his peace in God's goodness and love. Don't we have an amazing Saviour who has not only given us righteousness but has also asked God to give us the spirit of truth so that even in our darkest troubling times the spirit of truth will bring reminders of Jesus' words and actions of love and help us love others. And the spirit of truth will remind us of Jesus' promised gift of peace and how together they hold us in him and in love and faith with him. Yes, we have faith in an amazing Saviour who truly loves us and with a love that is out of this world. Amen.